you raise millions in investment, you start to scale your business only to discover your unit economics don't work. What do you do now? In this episode, we're gonna explore why developing and validating your startup scale plan can help you avoid this heartbreak at the most inopportune time. And we're gonna cover a whole lot more. I'm Stephen White, and this is Building Lean. Hey there, awesome founders. Welcome back once again to Building Lean, our series of workshops that cover the steps and activities your startup must take to build key business functions to sustainably generate revenues. Not only are our workshops inspired by thought leaders on startup and scale methodologies, but we also share our experience as founders as well as working with hundreds of startups and our research distilling the reasons why over 160 funded startups failed. And that's not all. We have Shafiq, patiently waiting to join us immediately after this workshop to answer your burning startup questions related to how you can build your startup lean. If you're interested in growing your startup by building lean, please subscribe to this YouTube channel and click that notification bell nearby so you can receive the latest insights that will help you avoid mistakes that cost you time and money. During our last episode, we explored what comprises your product assumption, particularly related to the value your product or service delivers when solving your customer's compelling problem. Without the ability to deliver measurable value, as in value that your customer recognizes, you will not be able to increase product usage and adoption rates. Not only that, you, you face the, the risk of customer churn, as well as slow adoption rates that correlate directly with poor or negative organic growth, all of which leading to higher customer acquisition costs. Now in this episode, we're discussing the fifth and final key business assumption, your scale assumption related to how you'll sustainably grow your business. Without the ability for your business to grow fast in a sustainable manner, you'll never be able to get ahead of your competition as you eventually lose market share to more nimble and faster moving competitors. Naturally, this tragic circumstance is related to the fifth fatal flaw when your business is too difficult, too complex, or too expensive to profitably grow. Now at this point, you may be thinking, this is great, Steven, but what I really wanna know is what does it take to turn my idea into a business? Look, as I introduced during episode two, a business is more than just a product. You have to build the key business activities in support of marketing, selling, producing, delivering, and supporting the product or service that will solve the compelling problem that your customer wants to pay you for. Now, You'd go crazy and frankly, you'd go broke trying to build each of these key business functions all at once. And for that matter, you can't just go and perfect each one and then move on to the next one. No, no, no. To be successful, you have to execute with an iterative approach where you prove just enough to move on to the next task. You can think of this as a crawl, walk, run approach to building your startup as Effectively, those iterations map directly to the three startup phases. Let's think of it this way. You would never expect a baby to run immediately because the risk of that baby falling in and experiencing injury is significant. And likewise, for us parents who get on our preteens and teenagers all the time, we do that because they practically crawl or saunter from one task to the next when they can do a whole bunch more. And the reason why we do that is because we have expectations that they're capable of more and more responsibilities. They've advanced past the baby stage. Well, your startup idea is similar to a baby. You're nurturing for great things ahead. You can't just suddenly expect the baby to figure things out on their own. No, 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 no. You have assumptions about what you need to do to get that baby into becoming a fully functional, productive adult. So let's look at how you're going to grow your baby. I mean, in this case, I'm talking about your startup baby, your baby that's your startup idea. Okay, so first off, let's define what key business functions your team will build out and automate in order to quickly scale your business. Okay, so why is that? Why do we start there? Well, it's actually simple. Without the key business functions working smoothly, you will not be able to consistently sell and deliver value to your customers, all of which has a negative impact on your cost of operating the business, leading to lower margins and loss of market share to those more nimble competitors. Now, obviously speaking, your team doesn't want your startup to struggle or fail because of all the time and effort that they've wasted alongside you, all the time and effort they've invested alongside of you tragically will be wasted with it, right? With its failure. So 
To demonstrate your startup can scale quickly, you do need to determine the feasibility of lowering the incremental cost of performing key business functions as the volume of your sales grow. The key business functions that you need to focus on are all the ones that allow you to sell faster, build your product faster, deliver your product to your customers faster, and finally achieve faster product adoption or usage by your customers. Matter of fact, the same is true through the R&D process that allows you to introduce add-on products to gain a bigger share of the wallet from your customers. Now for these add-on products, you must accelerate your ability to go from concept to value delivery. And you must purposefully focus on each aspect of the lead to cash journey in order to understand how you can quickly scale your business. By building this feasibility plan during market validation, you'll understand what you and your management team will be focused on in successful execution of your scale strategy. In matter of fact, you will validate your key assumptions in the repeatable sales and delivery phase as well as the sustainable growth phase. Without validating your feasibility plan, you'll end up scaling too early, which nearly always leads to your startup's death. Founders really want to scale early and they don't understand the risk that they're taking on. So let's look at why this is. In today's hyper-competitive world, grabbing market share and deterring competition is the key to your success. However, your initial success will alert competitors in the market that you have figured out a value proposition that they should pay attention to. This is why you want to hold off making a big public, a big public announcement to the world about your solution until you're absolutely ready to run fast, along with, let's say, about 12-month lead time that's based on a distinct competitive advantage over your competition. Don't worry, if you don't understand what a distinct competitive advantage is, we'll go over that in upcoming workshops. Now, once the market knows about you, almost immediately, established players will begin, um, uh, they will begin examining your product and trying to understand what makes your product unique. Now, this is not because they're in awe of you or want to buy you, so don't get fooled if they start calling and knocking on doors or sending you emails. No, no, no. Their first instinct will be to kill your product or service before you gain more traction. Sorry, it's a brutal truth. Effectively, if your competitors believe you have an advantage in delivering value that they do not possess, then they will want to move quickly to freeze the market and deprive you of the ability to grow. It seems, it seems like that stinks, but that's the reality of it. So if you don't believe me, let's look at a handful of examples of startups that made the wrong move and the consequences they experienced as a result. Shortly after Netscape had gained traction, Microsoft came out with the Internet Explorer browser. This browser was integrated into their dominant operating system as most every desktop or laptop ran on Windows. Yet the main benefit to customers that killed Netscape was that Microsoft gave away Internet Explorer for free. You know, right now it's really hard to believe, but customers actually had to buy an Internet browser to surf the web. In the Netscape Navigator browser, that application actually cost $49, which created a significant competitive weakness against a free browser that was integrated directly within an operating system. Without a doubt, that was a painful scale lesson learned by Netscape. You can just only say ouch to that one. Now, when Foursquare launched, it offered an easy way to find out where your friends were hanging out or places that they like to frequent. Checking in, we all familiar, we're all familiar with that, well, checking in someplace at the time was a novel concept that happened to use geolocation, surf uh, to geolocation to surface new and interesting places nearby. Something we take for granted now. While there were many startups working on the same concept, Foursquare was the market leader with its novel gamification approach to sharing your check-ins and getting more people to check in. By the time Facebook began providing their ability to check in or tag a location in their users' posts or photos, it was a well-established company. This meant that Facebook's users began to realize, why would I go to another app to check in when I could do that seamlessly with just one click in the app where I already interact with my friends? Foursquare's value to its customers began to quickly erode, causing it to look for opportunities to reinvent itself beyond its original service. In each of these first two instances, the established player looked at the underlying technology and knew they could easily replicate the solution. So, why does a larger competitor's announcement of adding a similar feature or product freeze the market? Because established players already have trusting relationships with their customers. If their customers believe 
they can buy the same capability under established relationships, then your differentiation is gone. For B2B startups, large enterprises are notorious for wanting to only do business with their existing qualified vendors. But this is true for consumers as well. So just think back a little bit. How many consumers likely held off on buying a new Fitbit when the first rumors started floating around about the Apple Watch? More recently, how many car buyers held off on replacing their aging vehicle when Tesla announced the Model 3? Or same thing for truck buyers waiting for the Cybertruck. Now, let's consider an example where the established player ignored the upstart with Netflix in Blockbuster. When Netflix launched its monthly mail-based DVD subscription service, Blockbuster ignored this competitive threat because it had built itself around the experience of going to the video store on demand and discovering a new movie with family and friends. That experience of coming to the store was important to the customer, or so Blockbuster believed. Plus, Blockbuster assumed most movie rentals were impulsive and had appropriate doubts regarding Netflix's financial model since it had attracted high volume video watchers as Netflix's early adopters. In essence, the Netflix strategy was like inviting it was like a buffet buffet that initially marketed itself to football players and sumo wrestlers. Seemingly a challenging model to pull off. However, what Blockbuster missed was that Netflix was refining its key business assumptions over and over again, especially related to the customer acquisition, service pricing, and product value delivery. DVDs delivered by mail just happened to be the initial method that it delivered its uh, delivered movies to its customers. Yet, Netflix knew full well that the technology for streaming video wouldn't be far off, which would eliminate the need to ever visit a video store. Look, Netflix didn't discuss a strategy until it was ready to roll it out and stay ahead of competitors. No PR campaigns, no unnecessary chest thumping, just getting down to business of validating its key assumptions. That's what we warn you about, not doing big public launch announcements until you're ready. Matter of fact, Netflix, Netflix was so ready, it executed its strategy effectively. Blockbuster didn't and shut down. A perfect roadmap that most founders should follow, but often don't because they let their ego or worry or mistaken advice get in the way. It's all about how well you build and deliver your value and how hidden it is to outsiders that determines your success. That is why you must plan to move fast. If you don't, established players, like in the examples earlier with Microsoft and Facebook, will almost certainly move quickly to prevent you from gaining any market share. Now, even if you're in a brand new market with a few established players, you must still look over your shoulder for other well-funded startups. Consider Lyft and Uber, along with the multitude of other startups in the ride-sharing space. All of them are still fight, they all still fight to be the dominant player. All of them are still fighting to do that, while worrying about other innovations related to, say, self-driving cars. If your startup is addressing a developing market, how will you retain your edge and rise above competitors quickly. So let's look at one final example. Now, this one is a bit different than the other ones. If you're, if you're the upstart competitor and not the market leader, pre-announcing a new, bigger, shinier version of your product or service can have catastrophic effects on your business. A classic example of this occurred back in 1981 when the PC industry was just getting started. At the time, there were many, many competitors trying to be the first company with a portable computer. The Osborne computer was the market leader in the luggable category. They were big machines, but they still were portable. Predicting only 10,000 total unit sales in their business plan, Osborne sold 11,000 of the Osborne one in the first eight months of the year with an additional 50,000 on back order. Now, unfortunately for Osborne, by 1983, Heavy competition led its CEO to make a critical mistake. He prematurely announced the next generation of its product, even though it was still one year away from release. However, at the time of the announcement, Osborne still had a large run of the Osborne 1 in inventory that suddenly it could no longer sell. This phenomenon became known as the Osborne effect. And we're not talking about Ozzy Osborne. In the Osborne effect, which today we would describe it as a cell phone. In other words, 
Never undercut your own business by pre-announcing the next generation of your product or service as that will free sales of your existing solution in your channel. Within 30 days of the Osborne CEO's announcement, the company had to drop its price of the Osborne One by 42%, nearly $400 from $1,285 per unit to less than $900 per unit. And this was due to all the canceled orders from coming in from dealers nationwide. Wow, just wow. You probably, you probably imagine it, it couldn't possibly get any worse than that, right? Well, I hate to tell you, in this story, there wasn't a happy ending. Within 12 months of pre-announcing the Osborne 2 version of its portable computer, Osborne had to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, and it never recovered as a business. Tragic. Absolutely tragic. Which means we can't let this happen to you and your startup. So let's explore how to avoid any of these horrible outcomes. So first off, you're going to want to establish KPIs for each key business activity as you work through your scale assumption. By setting growth objectives, you can develop a plan to drive KPIs in the right direction to achieve your growth objectives. But without having a KPI in mind, you're just kind of fumbling around the dark. So as an example, say of one of your sales engine KPIs, let's assume your growth objective is to reduce your lead to conversion time to 48 hours. You'll begin this by developing a plan to go from, say in that example, your current state of two weeks to close, to close a sale to two days. Now that seems, like a great theory, how do you do it? Well, you'll do this by decomposing the sales funnel process and intensely focusing on where time is wasted and delays occurs within the sales funnel so you can remove those obstacles. Your objective in developing your plans is to determine what processes you're going to optimize for each key activity. Before scaling, your startup's current business activity state is that you do things kind of slow and those activities cost too much for sustainable growth. They work for the first and second phase, startup phase, but not for scale. So, so to optimize, you first work on making each activity work faster. That's the thing. Focus on making the activities work faster. Then next, when you have the timing sped up for a key activity, you'll optimize your cost. See, once you have the time worked out, then you can worry about cost. And you'll go from a high cost per activity as, because the high cost, the activity has been sped up and, the high, and it may be high, a high cost to complete, you'll go from high cost per activity to a low cost per activity. By the way, if you follow what Amazon has done over the last 20 plus years since launching, this is exactly the scale plan that they follow for every product or service that they offer. Now, you will, you will use a similar strategy for optimizing your R&D key activities. You'll wanna establish the baseline KPIs for each activity and develop your objectives based on that timeline or ba excuse me, based on that baseline. Remember, you don't need to optimize fully in the first pass. This is an iterative process that you want to become part of your company's culture. Now, the metrics you'll track for R&D are a tad bit different. For the key activity of R&D, you will analyze competing feature requests that are coming in by first prioritizing your R&D efforts that help you improve your product so it can serve newer and newer market segments. Then you'll focus your R&D efforts on those that help you gain a bigger share of your customer's wallet from within your larger base of customers in each market, market segment you serve. So once again, as an example, if you want to open up new marketing and distribution channels, you'll focus on discovering gaps in your product that prevent you from serving the early majority when you start, a tar start to target a new market segment. You want to be able to cut down the time to work through early adopters to early majority. That would speed things up. In this case, as your channel activities will be focused on quickly establishing the infrastructure that will help you repeatedly generate qualified leads, you will go through the same iterative process you perform for your initial market segment by developing a manual process, then self-serve or automated one. You'll repeat this approach for each business assumption to validate that the new market segment can be effectively served by your product. Remember, speed of execution matters. In other words, the longer it takes you to establish your presence in the new market segment, the more likely a competitor observes what you're attempting and moves into that segment to establish themselves, which in turn makes it more difficult for you to gain traction with that segment. Now, don't worry about costs in the growth phase, uh, growth phase initially. Your job is to get a product ready as fast as possible to beat your competition and make it harder for them to compete with you. 
Once you've successfully increased the number of market segments you're able to successfully serve, then it's time to focus on increasing the wallet share you earn from each customer. This is when you release new features that you've been testing all along, not announcing to the world, and you add those, you offer those as added, as paid add-on services for your customer base. These new capabilities pair perfectly with newer versions of your product or service. You, that's how you plan it out. As a matter of fact, as a leader in this approach, we can look no further than Apple. Now, during our last episode, I covered how Apple stayed ahead of the competition by constantly delivering new features and capabilities for the Apple iPhone. What I didn't tell you was why Apple chose the specific order of feature, release, feature releases and how they came up with that order. Those decisions are a function of its scaling strategy that kept it ahead of the competition. When Apple released the original iPhone, it started out by initially focusing on the business unit, looking to carry one device for all their communication needs as they worked away from their desk and didn't have access to those critical business capabilities. Now quickly, Apple, uh, Apple expanded its product usage focus to other consumers like families, creatives, music aficionados, amateur photographers, and many, many other market segments. By focusing on features that expanded the consumer segments it could serve, Apple made its app store more valuable to app developers, which in turn allowed Apple to pursue its second strategy of increasing the wallet share of its consumers. Here you can see all of the add-on services Apple provides that has helped Apple increase its share of the wallet of the average consumer beyond its initial iPhone device sales. Now, there's one last point about growing market share by segments that I want you to know. When entering new market segments, it's important to remember that prematurely expanding to serve customers globally can be catastrophic. Even Apple didn't start launching new versions of the iPhone globally until iPhone 5. Apple would initially, even in that case, Apple would initially launch in the US and then follow up with global launches up to approximately 90 days later, depending on the country. Remember, even as Apple was shifting to global launches, Apple is already operating globally by the time they had launched the initial iPhone, so they knew the risk of launching globally from onset. That's why they were so pa patient until much later when they started doing more global launches of the iPhone. So as a startup, launching products globally with no global experience can really strain your organization's capability. And this is especially, while this is especially true for physical products, service businesses in global markets can also be complicated due to local rules and regulations. All of these things are complicated. And all this means is that you need to be careful when trying to serve new geographical markets. Always conquer your local market before expanding from there. Just remember that. Always conquer your local market before expanding from there. That way you know you have a solid base before you go global. All of these insights, by the way, are designed to avoid the fifth fatal flaw. With, once again, when your business is too complicated, costly, or difficult to grow. Often when founders experience early success during the first two startup phases, they presume scale will just happen or get figured out along the way while ignoring the considerable amount of risk that, that this creates when unexpected events occur or scale plans don't happen as presumed. We've all witnessed this related to recent events in the world. All right, now that you understand what comprises your scale assumption, let's look at how you'll know that you have validation for each startup phase. During the first startup phase, market validation, you will have validated your scale assumption when you're able to determine the feasibility of, number one, how you'll scale your lead generation. This means you're able to convert your manual lead engine to a self-serve model whereby you can generate the number of qualified leads you need within your cost constraints as well as your time constraints to sustainably grow your business. Number two, how you'll scale your sales conversions. This, mean you'll, this means you'll, you're able to convert your manual sales process into a self-serve model, whereby you can repeatedly convert qualified leads into paying customers within your cost constraints, time constraints, and conversion ratios. Now, if you're operating a B2B startup, I want you to note that it's not always possible to turn B2B sales into a self-serve model. In some cases, you still need a sales team, and you need to develop the infrastructure to speed up the selling process for that team with tools and resources. Also, you will need to determine the cost and time it takes to get each added salesperson productive. Okay, number three, how you'll scale your production and delivery. This means you're able to profitably solve your customer's compelling problem and could drive down your cost of production and delivery with increases in unit volume while also driving production adoption rates. 
And number four, how you'll scale your business activities. Those are the four things you need to know. And what this means for number four is, is that you're able to scale your business activities to sustainably grow, which will help you serve additional market segments, as well as gain market bigger share of your customer's wallet. You gotta remember one thing. It's important to note that during the market validation fees phase, you're only determine the feasibility of those four points I just talked about. You have to just focus on the feasibility of each of these actions and not actually performing the steps to scale your leads, sales, production, delivery, and business support activities. That's not the goal here. This means that you're only developing the hypotheses of how you perform the scaling function for each of these key activities. Now, during the second startup phase, repeatable sales and delivery, you're going to validate the hypothesis that you developed in the market validation startup phase. If, if one of your hypotheses fail, you'll need to develop your, a new hypothesis and subsequently validate that revised hypothesis in order to successfully complete the repeatable sales and delivery startup phase. So how do you validate your original hypothesis for each key business function? Once again, it's pretty simple. During the repeatable sales and delivery, phase, you're actually building each of the key business functions, such as your lead engine, sales engine, production and delivery engine, as well as the key activities like R&D, along with other B business activities such as customer support and uh, just internal functions. And all of these to ensure you can rapidly improve the product when you start to scale your business. Validation occurs when your predicted cost for each key business function is achieved as you and your team operate, actually operate the key business functions and capture the unit cost of performing them. In other words, this is a matter of actual costs versus budgeted. So to repeat, you have validation of your scale plan when you can repeatedly perform a key activity and the actual cost is less or less than or equal to your budget goal. In addition, you're able to determine that as you increase the volume of your production delivery, your cost will continue to, to, to decline for each key business function and activity. During the third st startup phase of sustainable growth, you'll focus on validating your growth hypotheses developed during the repeatable sales and delivery startup phase, as well as by serving more market segments and gaining an increased share of your customer's wallet. So this episode concludes the series of building lean workshops focused on the founder's journey framework and your key business assumptions. Now, don't worry, don't worry. We have plenty of episodes remaining in this season, season one. Matter of fact, in our upcoming episodes, we'll focus on the milestones you need to complete to successfully achieve the market validation and repeatable sales and delivery startup phases. We'll focus on those two. And we'll do this by unpacking the activities and steps tied to each milestone and compiled into project guides. The building lean process would be incomplete without understanding the milestones and data-driven decisions comprised in the project guides that help you understand the sequence of activities that can systematically help you transform your idea into a thriving, profitable business. Now, before we jump over to speak to answer your questions, if you're looking to change how you grow your startup by building lean and you find these workshops helpful, please subscribe to this YouTube channel and click to the click the notification bell, the click notification button nearby, as well as give us a like or drop a positive comment. Also, if you know of other founders or product managers who could benefit from our workshops, please share this video with them so they too can build their startups lean and avoid mistakes that cost time and money. That would help us tremendously. Building Lean is brought to you by the Lean Master Incubator. Unlike other incubators or accelerators that are only interested in getting you ready to pitch to investors, Lean Mastery helps you build key business functions that turn up revenues fast while helping you avoid mistakes that cost time and money. Learn more about how you can become a Lean Mastery Incubator member at leanmastery.co. Thank you all for watching and now over to speak to get us started with answering your burning startup questions. Hi everyone, Shafiq here. Now that you know why validating your key business assumptions related to scaling your startup is essential before ex attempting to execute your scale plan, we're going to pivot to answering questions submitted by founders like yourself. But before we do, I want to remind you to subscribe to our channel somewhere over here, and I know Steven's gonna claim it's magic, but just ignore him. Um, to our YouTube channel and click on the notification bell so you can gain immediate access to our latest episode. All right, hey Steven, are you ready with our first question? Why are you hating on the magic, Shafiq? All right, all right, fine, 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 fine. We'll save that for another episode. All right, yes I am, Shafiq, I am ready. Uh, I got that question right here. 
Uh, we'll jump right to it. So our first question comes from a startup CEO whose company has uh, had some strong early results, it appears, and maybe in the third startup phase of sustainable growth. Awesome. All right, now, uh, not that it matters, but I do. I, I just want to point out that I'm not sure if the CEO is part of the founding team, so this they may not have been part of the uh, scale plan um, planning process. But so let's jump. Uh, let's jump right into their question. Okay, here it goes. Hi there, Steven Schwieg. I'm not sure if this question is a fit for your Building Lean series, as we're further along than many startups. Our company provides enterprise software. And we, had init we initially had really good success out of the gate as we sold and delivered our product to 18 new B2B clients. That's pretty fantastic. However, right now we're stalled. We haven't been able to win any new client sales in the last eight months. Ouch. And we do, and the, and the question is, what do you recommend as a strategy to recover our momentum? Okay, so wow, there's a, there's a lot to unpack here uh, with that question. Well, there are many reasons why your business may have stalled out. Let me cover the most common reason based on our experience with startups in established markets. Assuming your 18 new B2B clients are still happy, the likely cause is that the market leader in your solution space moved quickly to stop you from gaining a foothold in their customer base. That is the first wall most startups encounter when they're starting to gain traction. The incumbent pre-announces a product to freeze would-be buyers, why does this work? Change is always costly for companies to shift to new vendors. There is a significant risk of disrupting existing processes and procedures with the adoption of a new solution. The incumbent relies on this undeniable truth to create fear, uncertainty, and doubt coupled with the promise of a brighter future for the customer if they would just continue on the path they've already chosen. If this is the reason why your new customers are not buying from you, then uh, you'll need to figure out how to manage the objections on two separate levels. Okay, so like uh, in any kind of battle, first you have to defend your startup against the attack by the incumbent. And, and you do this by reducing the risk associated with the change. So you can do, reduce the risk by reducing the time it takes to deploy your solution as well as gain the value of your solution, of using your solution that uh, was promised during the sales cycle. So let me demonstrate with an example using Steven's favorite ice cream. If you had a new ice cream flavor you wanted to sell uh, to Steven, you can't exactly tell Steven if he orders now, he can taste the ice cream in two months by traveling to a city 100 miles away. Steven wants to try the flavor now without having to take a long road trip to know if he would really like the ice cream. So in my example, sampling is a wonderful method for helping Steven experience for himself why your claim is true. Of course, you're not selling ice cream, so you'll have to work out how your customer can tell if your solution will work and deliver on the promised value as well as demonstrating why the switching costs are negligible, like they don't even matter. For complex solution, case studies that quantify results achieved as well as the time it took to achieve those results from an actual customer are very, very helpful in getting your prospect through the risk associated with change objection. And since you already have 18, publish, uh, 18 customers, uh, supposedly they like you, publishing case studies using their, uh, their gains should not be an issue. Second, uh, after you've done established a defensive perimeter, you need to go on the offensive and attack the incumbent by demonstrating to your customer the cost of waiting for a solution promised by the incumbent and the risk that poses. Depending on how entrenched the incumbent is and how much leverage they have on your prospect, you may not be able to make this argument. However, if the incumbent is weak and your prospect is very disillusioned by the incumbent's past performance, you can use that to position your solution as a better alternative that will, in the long run, clearly beat the incumbent. To make this argument, you must be able to explain why your solution is so much better than anything the incumbent currently has, as well as, uh, as, well as might deliver in the near future. In other words, you must explain your clear advantage that cannot be matched by the incumbent, and how your solution will have evolved even further in the time it takes the incumbent to release their first version. This is where sharing your product roadmap and how it will further deliver unending value 
to your prospect is an effective method to handle the fear, uncertainty, and doubt raised by the incumbent that will result from a change uh, in their exist, you know, from replacing their existing solution. So of course, my answer assumes that you have such an advantage and you, you are able to explain all these things, right? And more importantly, can clearly demonstrate the advantage in a measurable way. Um, Steven, would you like uh, to add any of your wisdom to this uh, answer? Okay, Shafiq. Yeah, I, I do have a couple thoughts on this. So first off, I, first off, I hope that the uh, the next questions we get, you at least start talking about appetizers because clearly you've already discussed steak and some dessert, which uh, now, of course, the conversation around ice cream and making me hungry, and I'm wondering why there's not any ice cream here. Um, the other thing is, though, uh, it's, it's kind of funny, Shafiq. Something that I, I've observed, I've, I've, I've really observed that exa further exasperates this stalled startup challenge for many, many uh, teams is when the sales team starts making promises to get deals done. Now, sometimes it's extra features not on the product roadmap or items that can lead to one-off solutions. In other cases, the sales team will promise free future upgrades when selling software licenses or even extra subscription licenses just being thrown in. The point is that startups need to maintain sales discipline and stay focused on understanding why they're losing deals so they can develop a permanent fix to the problem rather than taking a band-aid approach, which I think you really do a good job of explaining why it's so important to kind of work through uh, your positioning, whether it's that initially that defensive front or then getting on the offensive and defining why your product's so good. And, and if you don't, the risk for the sales team and the startup team is that panic and desperation starts to set in and that just ends up compounding mistakes that become fatal. All right, Shafiq, our next question comes from a founder whose startup is in the second startup phase and she writes, I'm really enjoying the series. We're struggling to drive down the cost of manufacturing our, our consumer packaged goods product with our manufacturing partners. Uh, they seem to be adding over, wow, 300% markup on material and labor costs. Man, that's, that's something. Uh, trying to build our own manufacturing capabilities requires way too much capital and does not seem to make to, uh, does not seem to make uh, to be a very smart strategy. Do you have any suggestions on how we can move forward with the production of our product while driving down costs? Oh, and Shafiq, uh, there is a follow-up question. Also, does your Lean Master Incubator help more advanced startups, or is it only focused on early stage ideas like most incubators? Okay, so let me take them uh, one at a time. So uh, this is a common problem for consumer packaged goods startups. In our experience, uh, this is especially true for consumer categories of consumer packaged goods. When using manufacturing partners to produce key parts necessary for your product or finding a manufacturing product that can uh, produce the whole product, you'll find that their quotes for producing small units uh, of the, either the parts or the whole product leave you very little room to make any money. The reason this is true is because when producing a product in small batches, the cost of setting up and tear down of the assembly line can double or triple the per unit costs associated with labor and material. Most manufacturing partners are set up for 24 seven operations where they can absorb the cost of setup and tear down over hundreds and thousands of units, meaning over 100,000 units, not hundreds and thousands. Uh, so anything less and the per unit costs rise dramatically eating into your margins. So how can you overcome this in the early days? First, you need to discover the unit volume where the price dropped dramatically. You will not get the volume pricing from the small partners that you initially contacted to get your quotes. The reason they respond to you is because they survive on small batches. The larger players will not respond to you when you try to get them to quote small quantities. So when reaching out to large players, ask them the minimum batch size quantity where they will produce your product. And then ask them how the cost will decrease with increased volume. Be sure to reach out to more than one partner if you're getting real, uh, if you, so that you're getting the real pricing and not some, something they just threw out. Because you have to be able to kind of balance you know, what you're hearing from the marketplace. So your approach should be to build up sales fast enough so you can switch from small batch partner to the large volume partner, whereby you can finally reach your margin goals. 
Your other option is to risk producing the larger quantity and then building up your sales while you have a gun to your head for the tied up capital and carrying cost of that capital. I would recommend using option one to rapidly improve the product in small batches until you can satisfy at least 100 customers with your product. Once you have that, then you should be able to increase your sales by uh, spending more on marketing when the sales volume increases to the point where you can sell the minimum batch size produced by the volume producer within 60 days. Then you can pull the trigger to manufacture with a larger partner and thus increase your margins. Now, be sure to negotiate sample runs as well as defined quality assurance process before you trust them to produce large volumes. This approach, of course, requires some amount of capital. The capital requirements increase depending on the amount of money you're losing per unit versus break-even versus the nominal gains uh, as you're doing the small batch uh, production. So to answer the second part of your question, yes, we help startups that are further along. Our repeated sales and delivery program can help you figure out how to get profitability as well as validating your scale hypothesis uh, Hypothesis. So you can learn more about the program at leanmastery.co. Uh, Steven, any, um, anything you want to add to that? That's great, Shafiq. Uh, I think uh, sometimes people assume, the, they see the word incubator and they assume it's just an early stage deal, but you actually, your incubate, we really are incubating the entire business development process where they're, we're, we're helping them build out those key business functions. So I'm glad you cleared that up for this, this founder. Uh, and I, I hope she applies. I hope she takes her team in and we'd love to work with them. Um, and also for that matter, uh, I'm really loving how you and I keep coming across startups that build stuff, right? Rather than just, I mean, look, I love the coding aspect of it, but it's fascinating because while the manufacturing process can be quite complicated and definitely require attention to detail, it, it's also tremendously exciting to see ideas come to life with a physical product. So it's really cool stuff. So I'm, I'm excited to hear more about uh, this founder's product. All right, we have our last question here. This question comes from a founder who just achieved market validation. Awesome, congrats to you and your team for that. Definitely, definitely something to savor and appreciate him uh, completing that phase. All right, uh, oh, and his team is working through the repeatable sales and delivery milestones. His question is, Thank you so much for doing this series, Stephen and Shafiq. You guys have explained so many things I never understood. Here is my question. We're trying to bootstrap our startup and get through the repeatable sales and delivery phase. Unfortunately, to really get those 100 customers to love our product, we need to hire lots of engineers. We don't have the funds to hire those engineers. Do you have any suggestions on how we can accomplish this without having to raise any money? Okay, um, so this is a bootstrapping question. So when bootstrapping, uh, you have to figure out how to build your product in phases that turn up revenue fast. If your core value prop consists of building a complicated product, is uh, what this sounds like, bootstrapping may not be the right approach. So when you, uh, when you say you need to hire lots of engineers, my, um, you know, my immediate thought is that uh, you have a very complicated solution. And I don't mean complicated in the sense uh, of the user experience sense, but complicated in the building sense. In other words, you have to solve many technical challenges in order to deliver the promised value through an easy to use solution. Now, good thing, thing about uh, something that's uh, complicated to solve is, you know, you, you raise the bar on the competition. Everybody else that follows you has to figure that out as well. But the downside is, you know, uh, you'll need to raise money because building complicated solutions requires, uh, uh, you know, talent. You can't just do it all by yourself. Um, so, you know, but the way I would kind of like to have you focus on is, but before you do raise that money, it would make a lot of sense for you to build your channel and your sales funnel while you're trying to build your production and delivery engine of your product. So as, you, as soon as you uh, have a working lead engine that can consistently turn up new customers on demand, then you can raise money with most angel investors. The reason is because you've significantly reduced their risk of product failure due to demand. In other words, as long as demand exists for you, the product that you're building, uh, then investors are always willing to bet on the side of meeting demand, right? So by solving the demand problem, you can ensure you'll have the necessary cycles to rapidly improve your product so that 100 customers will love your product. 
Now, if you're not sure how to do this, consider applying to our incubator. We help founders like you to quickly build their lead engine and sales engine. And now, I could be wrong about the reason why you need lots of engineers. If you're building a software solution, you don't need a very large team. Two to three crack coders should be enough to crank out the MVP to get 100 customers. If you're building a software product, you can recruit experienced technical talent with minimum salary, usually 75% of market, based on the promise of company shares. Experienced technical talent love a challenge and want to make an impact. Uh, that is why they don't care about salary when joining very large, uh, uh, very early stage startups. Typically, the first five technical uh, employees will get a better stock deal than all others that follow. Your challenge is to help them understand how you plan to change the world and why they should join your why should they should join you in your struggle. So consider this your first test before you try to raise hard dollars. If you cannot sell your idea and the work you've done in market validation to technical talent, then you certainly can't sell your idea to investors. Steven, you want to jump in here? I completely agree, Shafiq. Uh, I, th I think you covered all the high-level points. Uh, the the thing that co that co occurs um, strikes me is that it's tempting to overhire too much talent early on, and it kind of comes out of the out of fear that you'll fall behind or miss out on a particular skill. And really, startups should hire to fit their needs rather than just throwing bodies at a problem. And for that matter, the functional team leaders, in this case, maybe the product or engineering team leader needs to focus on team member alignment to really get the most out of uh, the team members that they have, the resources they have. Now, my favorite founder, uh, Elon Musk, he does cover this concept. He actually has given a presentation related to the concept of aligning vectors, which speaks to the efficiencies of small teams that, smartly organize, that are smartly organized and collaborate, collaborating effectively. And uh, for that matter, we probably should cover the aligning vectors topic in a future episode because it really speaks to the efficiencies of small teams competing against larger teams because of how uh, well organizing and coordinated the team members are. Okay, everyone, as a reminder, in addition to our regular incubator process, we're offering a special cohort for, for our incubator coming up. If you've ever tried to run a Kickstarter campaign and failed, or had a successful campaign but failed to continue selling your product post Kickstarter campaign, or are, trying, are thinking about running a brand new Kickstarter campaign, especially this fall or even next spring, you're going to want to apply to the Lean Mastery Incubator by August 15th so you can join our Kickstarter cohort. Spots are limited and we're already seeing some fantastic applications coming in. We use a rolling admissions process. And what that means is that the, it's important that the quicker you apply, the better the chance you'll have to gain one of these coveted Kickstarter cohort incubator spots. Now, this Kickstarter cohort will start on September 1st, 2020, so that's just around the corner. Now, to learn more about the Lean Mastery Incubator Kickstarter cohort and apply, visit leanmastery.co slash kickstarter. Y'all don't want to miss out on this, so get your applications in today. The application process will just take you, just to, to, to start the process will just take you minutes. Thank you all for watching, and we look forward to helping you be successful in pursuing your startup dreams by building Lean. Steven, could I just add one little quick thing? Uh, I want to make sure everybody understands that we encourage them to continue following our Building Lean series. Uh, if they want to do it on their own, our Building Lean series will give them lots of help. Uh, they should only apply to the incubator if they need help. Um, uh, we encourage everybody to follow along with us and, and more importantly, tell us how well it's working for them. So I uh, just wanted to add that. Thanks, Steven. <music>